Hey, Jason, welcome to the show. It's so glad to uh, have you on. My brother and I are excited to talk with you. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys. Awesome, man. Well, you know, for this part, for this episode, we thought it'd be really interesting to start with something that, you know, honestly, you mentioned 10 years ago at this point, but I think is still relevant uh, to our audience today. And I think to jazz players everywhere. Uh, you mentioned this concept of Jazz Nerds International. What is that? Oh. What is that concept that you came up with? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's funny you mention it because, uh, you know, as I have was critical of them, one thing I never got to do was to actually come to their defense. And, uh, <laughs> what it, and what it involved is that the best way to explain it is I was noticing a trend in the music that – uh, where a lot of the basic, the best way to explain it is a lot of the basic fundamentals that were part of the music were no longer a part of it. You know, just basic things, just learning a basic groove or, you know, learning a, a standard or just dealing with just basic simple things yeah. weren't in, in the music anymore. Now, I think that the, the more complex elements are important. They shouldn't be thrown away. But uh, what happens is that the simple parts either get taken for granted or just not used at all. And so what you get are these guys that only focus on complex things only. And that's all they're interested in. And so, you know, you don't really hear any blues. You don't really hear any kind of folk music of, of any sense, really. It's just all complex music. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, a lot of it has to do with, uh, unfortunately, a lot of music, even in popular culture, being taken away. Uh, and, you know, for example, I'll just say this real quick. One of the things that I will always be envious of my old brothers, Wynton and Bradford, for is the fact that they actually had a chance to play in, in a funk band. Mm -hmm. And in New Orleans in the 1970s, there were all these funk bands playing music by the popular music of that time, whether it was Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Parliament, Earth, Wind and Fire, etc., etc. And so they had a chance to play school dances and things of that nature. By the time Delphio gets to high school, that all was gone. Mm. And all that's when school dances were hiring DJs and there were no bands. Mm, right. um, and so I think that there was a social element to the music that uh, was lost there. And when I was coming up, I, I, there was a lot that I was able to figure out, but that kind of element wasn't as common as it had been. And so, the, and so as time went on, it got worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what you get are these these guys that that learn about the music in school, and if you're not in a place where you can either experience things on either gigs or playing for audiences or what have you, all you know is uh, just these these uh, God, what is it things you learn in academia like that's your experience. Right. And it's not for playing for people or playing for audiences or playing on a gig where you have a defined role. It just turns into well, you know, it turns into whatever it is you want to do. And so a lot of education focuses on complex elements. And so a lot of the guys that were start, that the music started to go in that direction. And so I started to see a lot of it. And that's when, you know, finally, you know, after just being frustrated with jazz records post 2000, in my view, uh, that's when uh, there was a statement that that someone, I think it may have been Bradford, which is very fitting, where he said, man, he was, he didn't like the music either. And he was saying, man, there's these guys playing all this nerd music. And when he said that, I said, that's it. They're jazz nerds. That's the problem. <laughs> that, that's, that's what I don't like about any of this at all. And, uh, yeah, and another thing, too, is that, and I think it ties into the social element. Uh, I think, you know, the music used to be a part of either a social element or a community. And so I think that's how the older players had so much more personality. Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, just American people, honestly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Honestly, cause, because the, cause the irony is that uh, I think in later times, you know, a lot of that personality got stomped out. And the irony is you could actually say the same thing even in pop music, honestly. Yeah. You could you could see a similar thing because in the late '90s, what you started to see were a lot of these teen pop stars, and they were like very cookie cutter, all kind of the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they except now instead of focusing on complex things, 
their their music honestly was dumbed down because there was a lot of mentoring that they didn't get either. <laughs> so, uh, so there's so it, it almost it, it's almost like an it's an opposite end of the same coin. Yeah. Uh, so, I, so I think that. But anyway, but that's what I was just so. So anyway, but in the music, you know, after about ten years of just hearing either the the after ten years of hearing music that was either esoteric or using ethereal rock, but not in but in a more dull kind of way, mm-hmm. it just got I just couldn't. And I think I wasn't inspired by it, but also the people I worked with didn't know that any of this was even going on. Hmm. They had no idea that any of this even happened. Like I think some people were thinking that New York was the same as it always had been, and mm-hmm. things were just going on. And a lot of people hadn't realized, like, no, this is different. This is not the scene mm-hmm. you remember. This is turning into something else. Uh, so I think that uh, the final straw came when my father saw a show of a band, and. He was saying that, you know, it was a show that he wasn't that crazy about. He was saying, piano player was doing his best Keith Jarrett impression. And, <laughs> you know, and the guys would play a solo, and at the end of the solo, he'd go in the corner and look at the ground, and nobody's looking at the audience. Mm-hmm. And, and he said that, but when he, when he looked at the audience, he then saw an audience of people working at trying to enjoy the show. Yeah. Let me repeat that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They didn't. They didn't enjoy the show. They didn't believe in it. They were trying to, but they were working at it. And so that's when I just said, you know what? I'm calling this out. I've, I've had it. That's enough. Because, uh, and so that's when I just, you know, made, I, and the, the video thing that I did uh, came up, I actually had a gig. <laughs> because I would, I would do this gig and I would, I would, there was a tune that I wrote that was a blues and and then I would start talking about jazz nerds and the audience is like huh (laughs) what are you talking about but there'd be those few people that would say yeah okay there's a few people that would get it Mm -hmm. yeah so there was a guy that that heard heard me give this little spiel he said man can I make a video of that man Mm -hmm. he loved it so we we made the video and put it up, and I didn't expect the reaction to be what it was, but uh, but nonetheless, I think that the J and I thing, it, that's what it really has to do with, unfortunately. And I never really was able to come to those students' defense, mm-hmm. because in their defense, a lot of the social things they don't get to experience. I mean, a lot of the kinds of gigs that older musicians had, they don't get to experience that, mm-hmm. and so a lot of what they learn is. You know, whatever is being taught in academia, and usually that's about harmony and playing complex things, or, or trying to play the newest thing, and 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 I've I've got my issues with that too. So, but anyway, that's what that's about. Yeah, and to go back to your point on the playing for an audience, how do you think a young musician could approach that if they, you know, they're in school and they're focused so much on the education and learning, you know, um, all the you know, musical aspects, how can they focus on what the audience might actually want? Well, and it is a tough thing because um, I think that one, there's a way that you have to teach the music that relates to the gig. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Uh, when, When my... There's a, a for and the best example that I can think of was there was this one day that my father was in when he was teaching at Noka, and this is when Wynton and Bradford were students there, mm-hmm. and they had a field trip to go to a recording studio, and the field trip was about you know this studio like and you this is a studio he explained the whole thing and you know and they're there. And they're talking about it. And then this guy comes up and says, man, I really like your band, man. Can I use them? And Dad said, well, great. Okay, find out how much it pays. What are the hours? What are the this? And Mm -hmm. that ended up being like a recording. And I think the guy's name is A.J. Laurier. And there's like a recording of Winton and Bradford and I think Donald Harrison when they're NOCA students. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, but that was related to like actual like real life situation, like the recording studio. That and I think that is important to relate the music to that and not just what to play on chord changes, mm-hmm. but relating it to when you play for an audience. Uh, you know, there's one playing for the audience. Two, there's introducing the tune. Three, how do you introduce the tune? Uh, I think you know. To be honest, some have said that. You know, when I've introduced tunes, that sometimes I take too long, and that may be true because some of it is me over, sort of overemphasizing, over sort of overemphasizing for the guys that don't say anything at all, mm-hmm. right? Because you do have that. Some musicians say absolutely nothing, and the audience is like, "What just happened?" Uh, but I think also understanding that there's an audience that does want to feel something, uh, and that also. The audience, um, there's a lot of things that went through my mind here. But, uh, for example, if you take something like the swing element, you know, I think there's a tendency for the student who may not believe in it, and that's okay, that's another conversation, but there's a tendency to think, oh, yeah, this is that old style that nobody wants to hear that anymore. But if you really swing some music, there's an audience that will love it. I would really like it and say, oh, man, that was nice. And I think it's it can be easy to take that for granted, especially in the age of what I like to refer to. We're at a time where there's a tendency to hear a lot of what I call innovation propaganda. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole, the music must be new, the music must be different, and audiences want to hear something new. And the, the problem with that is that, honestly... To be candid, man, the artists now don't know anything about the music at all. Right. I mean, they, they don't. So, they're, they're, I mean, you know, this is, I mean, it's very different from when Wynton was coming up because, hell, when he was coming up, there were people that would talk to him, and I'm sure it was maybe some musicians, but maybe it was some audience people, and they were saying, man, you're not playing jazz. Leave organ is jazz. Freddie Hubbard is jazz. What do you play? Which was a legitimate question. <laughs> but that's another conversation. But you had audiences who knew who those people were. The audiences now don't know what any of that is. Mm-hmm. And so I think that when you come up with this, we need to do something now, you're assuming that the audience knows 100 years of music. They've heard Lawrence Armstrong and the High Fives. They've heard Jelly Roll Morton's music. They've heard the Benny Goodman Big Band. They've heard the small group of Benny Goodman. They've heard uh, John Kirby Sextet. They've heard Des Bird. Well, you, you get the idea. Yeah. yeah. They've heard all of that, and they want something else. Okay, <laughs> right. Like, actually, they don't know any of this. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The percentage is, <laughs> yeah. I mean, to the point where you, you'll have people going into the preservation hall and saying, wow, we've never heard music like this. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's like supposed to be the old style. Yeah. And folks have never heard any music like that, which then they may not have. Uh, so I think that it is important to know that, uh, you know, to know those things, that there are things that audiences believe in. And also I think the final thing is just to really believe in what it is that you're doing and not just something to do. But that you really love it, you really believe in it, and you want your audience to believe in it too. Yeah, it's a great final point. Awesome. I yeah. mean, with everything that you've been saying and and kind of what we're speaking to with our audience, you know, I think this leads to a great point, which is how then do you define what is jazz? Because, you know, you've done so much work with many different groups of all kinds, combining different genres even with yeah. jazz. And I think a lot of uh, players today are finding it hard to define that, uh, you know, that term. And I think that leads to kind of an identity crisis. So how do you define what is and isn't jazz? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because I, to me, that's not really that big of a deal at this point for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think that there was a time and some people still are thinking that that's going on, but it's not. I know that there was a time where it, it was an important thing, you know, to identify what the music is. Uh, and, and it was a big thing. Well, this is jazz. This is not. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's really the, the issue at this point. I think that there's other issues that are more pressing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like one, 
uh, people like learning how to play and actually learning music is a lot more important because honestly they're not. Uh, so I think that the way I see it, I think it is important to understand the importance of what was contributed in the 20th century. Hmm. And, you know, I think it is important. I do think that the two most important elements are blues, which is the folk music, and swing, which is rhythm. But I also know that there's other rhythms that can be brought into the music. And there's other folk music that can be brought into the music. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, for example... Uh, it, it, for example, there was a record I heard, and this was around this time of like the early 2000s when I was being sort of disappointed with a lot of the newer music. And and at first I was thinking, well, you know, they're, they're, a lot of guys are, they're not utilizing the swing element, man. And that's why the music is boring. Well, that wasn't it, because I heard a recording from a vibraphonist from France named Hubert Lucaron. And he came to New Orleans, and unfortunately, I missed the show. I had to go out of town, but, and I think he borrowed my vibes. I come back to pick him up, and this is, yes, no, Barry, he left his CD. I was like, oh, okay. I'm always left CDs, mm -hmm. but this one looked rather professional. I said, okay, I'll check this out. And I put on the first tune, and all of a sudden, I'm like, mind is blown. I'm like, this is killing, actually. This is like, and it was inspiring, and it's like the kind of thing that I look for in music. And... You know, and I'm listening to it, and there actually wasn't really swing on the record. Hmm. But there was European folk music. There was European folk music, and, you know, there was still, it wasn't blues-based. He would, he would use, play some blues here and there, though. He would use it. But it was based more on European folk music. And I just said, yeah, this is, this is it. This is amazing. And, and so I think that, um, and, but, and, and, but I think that that, to me, it, it, it explained a lot. Mm. And so I think that swing is important, but it's also un, it's un, uh, important to understand blues and to understand folk music. And so even if somebody decides, well, we're not going to do swing, but say, we're going to have these different grooves, and we're going to have these different rhythms, and, and that's what they were doing, and it was amazing. And so that's, to me, I think is what's important to understand. Yeah. What do you think are those fundamentals? You mentioned, you know, for the students, they're missing out on even just a basic music, music education. What would be some of those specific things that you think they're missing? Uh, one thing that's missing, and I'm, I'm sympathetic towards it, I think is um, understanding uh, traditional jazz and those elements. Mm -hmm. And long story short, I think, that music is seen in most cases as a separate culture. And so you'll have people that are teaching who either one don't care about it or two don't know anything about it. And so it's not really taught as much unless you're now, it's ironic. I'm in the studio with double wide and, and the Susan player, Matt Ryan, who's, who's from Sacramento, California, but lives in New Orleans. He actually teaches a class that deals with tradi tra traditional jazz, but it's rare. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of fundamentals that can help any musician with any music they want to play, any music they want to play. I think that's one. I think two is to uh, not be afraid of basics or not be bored with basics. Uh, and I think that's something that often does happen where, uh, it, where a student now, and there's reasons for it, but a student now, if you show them basics, they either may lack it or some may even ridicule it. I was telling a student a story about Elvin Jones. Uh, when he was in the 60s, he was playing this, this trad gig with uh, Tyree Glenn. And all he was playing was this rim shot, you know, two and four. And I'll demonstrate a little bit, you know. Yeah. And that was the whole gig. I mean, that was the whole gig. And so... I'm telling the student this, and you know, I was like, you know, proud of the story. And then the student has this attitude, this negative attitude, and asked me, why did he do that? Did he just see it, do it just to see if he could? I was like, man. And I had to resist, you know, giving a, a symbol standard, beating him with it for 30 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, Cooler has prevailed. And what I told him was, well, no, he did it because if he didn't do it, he would have gotten fired. Yeah. Right. Which actually is what happened. Uh, I, think, I think he got he hired a drummer to sub for him 
And the drummer thought that he was to play the way Elvin played with Coltrane. It was uh. a disaster. And when he got back, they said, he's like, where's the drummer? He said, man, that drummer you hired was a disaster because you hired him. You're fired. And so that was how it was back then. But those simple things, re but really mastering them, because it, it's not easy. It's not easy, but if you really master that, then anything you want to play after that. Uh, I mean, even playing a simple funk groove, you know, even just playing like, And just grooving the hell out of it. Right. Like, that's all you're playing. Like, master that. And so, just, I, that's what I mean. Like, those kind of fundamentals. I mean, what happens with, with students is that they get impressed with fancy things, which isn't a new phenomenon. I think that the phenomenon has increased with, since we're in the YouTube era and the internet era, I think that phenomenon is it, it's more extreme than it has been in the past. Uh, and also, there's less, I would have to be candid and say that I think that we have uh, failed as mentors in terms of excellence in music. <laughs> if I had to be honest, I think we've just failed. You know, because, like, uh, for example, if we take these drummers that play in these black churches now, you know, a lot of them see the, the website gospelchops.com yeah. and want to play like that. And so now you have all these drummers around the country who sound exactly the same. Right. And, you know, and there's a lot of basic things that they don't have. But at the same time, the churches aren't necessarily telling them, no, no, don't play this. Um, right. Like, like, like the drummers Herman Riley and Shannon Powell. Now, they come from an old church. And I haven't, I, at some point, I want to have a, a, an interview with them to talk about old church. Mm -hmm. How you couldn't just, you know, all that fast stuff, you couldn't do that. It's like, no, 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 no. Here, you know, as as the video, that, that's the movie that just came out, Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace. Yeah. I mean, that explains a lot in terms of, that's another example of great music. And but you see, the, there's fundamental things about it that shouldn't be taken for granted, right? So, so anyway, that's what. Uh, so I'm referring to that. Yeah. What do you think someone like your father did that was so great in mentoring versus what maybe some of the mentors now are doing in, in their education? Well, I think that one, what he did was uh, he wanted the student to discover the answer. Mm. He didn't tell the student the answer. He, and he talks about the art of discovery. Mm. You know, he wanted the student to have that. And two, I think another thing was he, uh, I think taught like the music as a whole. Like, like when I, like it, it was really like, I think he taught the music as a whole and he would teach based on the repertoire and based on the records. Mm. I mean, there's so many stories I've heard from him that involve, like, records. Like, one, he, he told this one funny story about uh, he was playing a Jelly Roll Morton record for a class, and one of the students said, man, I didn't know these guys were playing over chord changes. <laughs> you know, and then there was another record that he played for a student who was, like, a big George Benson fan, and this is in the 1970s, and this is when, like, you know, Breezin was a huge record. Mm -hmm. So my father said, oh, okay, you're in the Benson? Fine. He puts on paraphernalia for Miles in the Sky, which Benson's on. And the student heard that and said, oh, all I thought there was that Benson was breezing. So it's to let him know, yeah, Benson can really play. I mean, this is great, but there's this other stuff that he can do, too. Yeah. And the student said, oh, okay. Uh, and I think that um, he, in fact, he even has talked about uh, forming his own uh, curriculum with how to really deal with teaching the music. And I think he deals with teaching it uh, on, you know, like using all of the elements hmm. rather than getting wrapped up in, you know, you can use these scales to play on these chords and you can use this type of heart. It's, it's not just that. It's more of a holistic approach to playing the music. Right. Yeah, that's super interesting. Thanks for that. I mean... Yeah. Well, um, one thing we wanted to get into a little bit was, and especially as 
we we were doing some research. We everything you're doing is traditional, but mixed with so many uh, explorations. Uh, your last album, Melody Reimagined, Book One. Uh, yes, we found it very interesting the way you approached the compositions on that album, and we kind of want to get into that because I think so many. We've seen this many times, and uh, you know, you see musicians put out albums, especially in the jazz arena, where they're they're kind of just redoing the same, either the same standards or or you know, it it's kind of like there's not much new creative thought into how to go about that. And I think uh, the way you approached your last album was pretty unique. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the well, the thing is, when I mentioned, you know, utilizing the music from the past hundred years. And I mean that literally, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that what tends to happen is that <sighs> I'm trying to think of an economical way to answer this without going on a damn tangent. <laughs> and, you know, the average person, and there was, there was a study done on this where the average person, there was, there was a, I think a study done where it was discovered that when it comes to music, the average person, only what is it they said when they get to the age when they get to age 30 they don't listen to anything new they just go with whatever it is that they know mm. yeah now this, this isn't finite it's just that was the average yeah. person you know like the music they were into when they were in high school and college and that's it that's what they know and i think that with a lot of even jazz music that has happened and to be honest you know when I think the reason why even my older brother Winton did a lot of the things that he did was because he was the very same way. <laughs> I mean, the music that he was based out of, honestly, was the 50s and the 60s, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And as time went out, he checked out on things, but I think he realized, wait a minute, I actually, you know, I'm not really comfortable, I'm not really that great with the traditional style, man. I ought to deal with that a little bit more, or, you know, of different mm -hmm. styles. And he realized, oh, <laughs> so, and I think there's a tendency to focus on one error. And then there are no one error, and that's it. So I think a lot of times with the standards, it, it can be easy to do that with the 50s and 60s. And what I wanted to do, it was an album that evolved because I would play these tunes, these standards, to fill in the set with other originals. And after a while, I thought, well, man, why don't I just write my own tune? So a melody, you know, a melody may come from a certain place, and then it ends up being the changes to John Coltrane's training in or locomotion from blue train. Well, let's use that, you know, and then, well, you know, with you stepped out of a dream, let's use that, but let's have it more compositional. And then, well, let's use the changes to Avalon, which is like an old, that's like, mm -hmm. old, like swing track tune, but let's make the, let's make the changes more abstract than they are. You know, let's make the changes more complex, you know, really open it up. Now, I think that the one that I had the most fun working on was a tune called Passionate Dancer. And that to me was the most fun and because it was based on the tune Maniac by Michael Sembello. <laughs> and uh, the way that tune came about was I was, um, I was looking up that song. I can't even remember why, but I was looking up the song. And, you know, I'm checking it out. And for the first time, I noticed the chord changes. <laughs> I've never <laughs> noticed them. And I'm like, these chord changes are happening. <laughs> and, well, wait a minute. Because, see, pop music, especially in the 80s, man, you can get so distracted with production and, and the groove and sound and music yeah. videos to where you don't really notice the music. And that's good and bad. <laughs> you know, I mean, whether the music is great, sometimes the music isn't that great. But it has great production. You don't notice so in this case, I heard these chords and I said, I'm going to use these chords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right in tune, I'm using these chords. <laughs> because nobody would necessarily think to take an 80s pop tune and use those chords for, for a melody. But it's fair game. So I did that. And so, so when I rehearsed with the band, at this point, the album was being put together. And we're rehearsing with the band. And I said, yeah, man, I got another. So they knew what the record was going to be, tunes based on standards. I said, yeah, man. So I got another tune for the record. <laughs> we played the tune. <laughs> but they got to the end. They're like, what is that based on? Because they couldn't recognize it. Or what standard is standard. that? <laughs> like, what is that? Like, here. So we put on the record over the loudspeaker. And the drummer's like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no. Listen to these chords. That's and amazing. 
And I think somebody in the band didn't know it at all. Like they were like, man, I don't know this at all. <laughs> but anyway, that's beside the point. But that was what I what I like doing this. I like taking changes from different places. Not just standards is great, but just other places you can take from tunes, old and new. Right. Yeah. Just to segue a little bit, we wanted to get into your approach on playing solo drums because we know you've done that a lot. We've checked out some video, and I think a bunch of our audience would really like to see how you approach that. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, the 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 solo shows I've been trying, I've been doing more of lately, and. Uh, and it, I, would, I think what really inspired me to really go that direction, it's something that I've been teasing. What finally inspired it was uh, when I was on a sound check with uh, bassist Brad. I was playing with Marcus Roberts. And I was doing sound check. I was playing something. And Rodney Jordan, the bassist in the group, was checking it out. And he liked whatever it was. And Rodney just said, you know what, man? Man, I would buy a CD if you just playing solo drums. I would buy that. I was like, you know what? I need to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we do uh, these uh, residencies at Florida State University. And the next time we did one, I called the school and said, I'd like to do a recital. It's solo drums. It's just me. That's it. And I'm going to do it at this hall. And I put it together. And, every, and the people really like the show. The people really like, you know, Rodney Marks. They were all there. The musicians we were working with were all there, and they liked the show. And I, and I, you know, and then I said, man, I need to do more of these. Mm-hmm. And so the, 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 the reason that I started to do it and that I'm going to keep doing it is that, one, my approach to drum solo had to do with telling a story. And I think that it, it started, I think, sometime in, in, in high school, really. You know how I started to approach solos. Like there came a point where I started to really think about how did I want to take a solo, mm. and I think one solo that I mean, you know, I'd always transcribe solos, but I remember this one record of Max Roach's called "Percussion Bittersweet" that I heard, and the first tune had a solo where he's this percussionist playing a six eight uh, African rhythm, and he solos over this. And he's using the space, and he's playing. He's, and I just said, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it was such a deep conceptual thing. Hmm. And I just said, yeah, this, okay, I want to go in this direction. And doing other things, rather than playing the typical solo. Now, now, at the same time, I remember once hearing a solo that was not inspiring, that I didn't like. I liked the record, but this one solo, this drummer played, I didn't really like. But I asked myself, wait, why didn't I like this? You know, it wasn't enough to say, oh, this is sad, the end. I'm like, wait, why didn't I like that? I said, oh, okay, he's playing out of time, but it's not really that memorable. Let me listen to another drummer that plays out of time, Tony Williams. Mm -hmm. Let me see what Tony Williams does. That's different. And I realized, okay, Tony plays themes. Hmm. Okay, he plays themes that are memorable. He plays motifs that are memorable. He will develop a phrase. He, He uses repetition. However, this other drummer, it sounded like he was just kind of playing around a kit. Mm. And there wasn't really anything that stood out. And I remember at that moment, I said, okay, that's what I'm going to be doing with my own solos. And so then, you know, I would maybe do a solo on a, like, just a solo. Not a lot, but a solo just by myself on occasion. Not often, but on occasion. But it was at some point recently, I, I did them... Uh, uh, you know, a little more, and finally I said, man, I got to start doing my own solo shows, and I want to keep doing it, and eventually I will uh, record a solo record, but uh, essentially, it, it, I like to, and I'm doing it to show the audience that there's a lot that can be done with drums. It isn't playing fast, and that's it. There's a lot you can do, whether it's playing slow, whether it's playing different moves, whether it's showcasing different timbres, whether it's sometimes even playing the rhythms of pieces. <laughs> sometimes it's that, uh, you know, playing melodies of things. Uh, like, for example, I do a solo that's based on Weather Report's uh, Scarlet Woman, for instance. Sometimes using that, and there's a way that you can build a solo, and you're presenting a whole piece. 
rather than you just playing some fast ideas. Uh, so that's how I've been approaching it. It's a way to show that there's a lot that the drums can do. And and it's a lot of instruments. And the co you know, my brother went and he even said, Yeah, man, drums is a really emotional instrument. And he's right. And so and to be honest, I need to get pulled more emotion out of the drums. But that's the approach. It's about telling stories and uh, you know, showcasing the different things that the drums can do. Yeah. That, thanks for that. That I think that'll really help a lot of uh, the drummers listening. Hopefully so. Yeah. Um, I think we have a few audience questions. Um, sure. So we just want to make sure we have time for that. Um, this one's from Flora Bassist, and they say, "How do you handle jam sessions and musicians that are being vibey?" Oh yes, yeah. Um, wow, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I've actually had a few jam session massacres in my life. Uh, yeah. Um, wow. Um, you know, that's a tough, it's tough because, see, I got to think about it. Uh, the, man, the reason why I'm having trouble answering the question mm -hmm. is because, unfortunately, I think one of the problems music has is that everything is up for debate. Like, everything. Mm -hmm. That's not a good idea. I think there should be debate, but I don't think every single thing should be up for debate. You know, like, for example, I was at a session where I'll, I'll give the short version. There's a drummer that comes up and plays, and he was just playing horribly. It was not, it didn't have anything to do with what the musicians were doing, and it wasn't supporting the band. And this went on for 10 minutes. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And I went up to him and said, is it okay if I play on some of this? And he said, yeah. So I did, you know. <laughs> And started swinging out and supporting the music and so forth. And, you know, and, um, you know, and then the tune ended. And then later, uh, the bass player was upset with me, saying, well, that was rude what you did. He was playing. It wasn't your turn. And I'm like, well, man, he wasn't supporting the music. That's just your opinion. Man, the audience didn't really like what he was doing. That's just their opinion. What about the people that wanted to hear him play? No one wanted to hear him play. Nobody <laughs> wanted to hear that. But it's like everything. So what happens is... Um, it's tough to answer the question. Uh, I think it's important to have like somebody that's really in charge of the session. Mm. And if, if there's any problem, someone can say, okay, we need to stop this too. We need to, I think that's the thing. It has to be run properly because unfortunately what can happen is if you have guys that have this dark attitude, if nobody's really running it, it can be hard to say, Hey man, stop this. We need to move on. And, you know, if nobody does, it can be hard to do that. Uh, so I think that that's that's number one. Now, the only thing I can say, I don't necessarily recommend this, but I will admit that there was one session that I did where things were getting out of hand. And uh, I think all these guys were, you know, everybody was just kind of soloing along. It was getting out of hand. And, we, and when we got to the end of the tune, I started playing super loud and super unmusical. It was really rude, and it was that was the whole purpose of it, and I was so angry. Because <laughs> in my mind, I'm thinking, this is why people don't like this music, because it's because of you morons. <laughs> and I was so, I was like, and one of the guys looked at me like, uh, and then all of a sudden, the room gets like really quiet. Right. People can sense something's wrong, and the guy's like, Are you okay, man? Play the next tune! And I'm just angry. Like, play the next song, now! <laughs> he was just like really... But the irony of it is the next tune, everybody took one chorus solo. <laughs> <laughs> Message received. Yeah. They knew exactly. So all of a sudden, the next tune was just for us. Everybody takes one chorus. <laughs> I don't know. This is... So, I mean, it's unfortunate, but that actually works. <laughs> and that, it, you know, it's not... So I... And it was to send a message like, y'all are going to stop or else... I could get worse, and you may you may end up going to the hospital right. <laughs> from my account. So stop. But I think that, uh, that so anyway, that's the thing. I think the best way is that it's properly run, and you let guys know. You don't just let it become a free for all. You have to let them know. Look, even if they're real dark, like, hey man, you know this is what we're doing here. 
you know, you play on this tune, only take these few courses, and that's it. I think it has to be run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's that's. I think that's the best answer I can give. That there's run and that there's some rules and understanding. Because unfortunately, there's some sessions where everything is just fine, mm-hmm. and there's no problem. Even though even if the music isn't good, but that's okay. <laughs> and it's like, no, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> so. Uh, that's the best way I can answer that. I hope that that, that answers. No, that's a great. I think that really helps, and and I think that's the right direction that all jam sessions should <laughs> follow is to have some some direct some leadership and direction. Um, one other fan question we had here was from Mattia Facchini, and uh, they ask, please have him elaborate on his practice routine. Now, not only I know you might even elaborate on different area phases of your life, but you have multiple instruments. You might elaborate on this, uh, but. I think students of our audience, you know, they're looking for some guidance on practice routine in general. Maybe there's some just good concepts or techniques that apply across the board. Yes. Um, number one is, uh, you know, because there's so much to practice and sometimes you just have to spend 10 minutes on each thing. Mm-hmm. But I think that it is important at some point to involve the book Stick Control. You know, even if it's just like playing singles on a pad or, or on a snare drum for 20 minutes, you know, just at a solid tempo, you know, something that's, uh, you know, just the way you can focus on sound and clarity. You know, that's one thing. It's also good to practice just a swing rhythm where you focus on just the swing and just the ride cymbal and make it sound good and have a good clear sound and attack. Uh, that's two. And three, you even practicing a groove, even if it's playing a funk groove for 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, that's a good thing because that helps with your sound and your attack and just your groove. And, you know, it adds more life into what it is that you play. Uh, there's also uh, practicing with brushes, which you can practice uh, sweeps for 10 minutes. Uh, you can even practice attacks like you can use rudiments on the brushes by playing the brushes like the drumsticks where you're playing on the tips of, of, the, of, the, of the brush. Uh, so that's, uh, that's um, uh, you know, that can be 10 minutes there. So then it's good to do different things in 10 minute increments. Uh, if you want to cover a lot of bases. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes you just need to spend an hour on something or 30 minutes on one thing and that's fine too. But Ultimately, it is about covering the different things that you need to cover that will that that and those are things that can help you become better in whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one other thing, too, is practicing singles around the drums, like from snare to drum to all the toms and playing them around both counterclockwise and clockwise. That helps you get around the kit. So that's in it, too. So anyway, that but that's. One sort of variation on a, on a, on a practice regimen. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. No, I think that'll be really helpful. Um, yeah. Our last audience question comes from Joey Bates, 14. And he's asking, okay. how do you write for drums if you don't play drums? So maybe in a big band context or he's part of a group and he doesn't know maybe how to direct the drummer. Okay, yeah, that's a good question, man, because historically... Drummers usually don't get music. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like like drummers usually get like the first trumpet part and they just try to right. figure it out. <laughs> but at the same time, I think it is good to write some things out. And there is a way to write drum music. There's rhythmic notation in which there's a, uh, it's a, God, what is it? That, it's a clef. It's not like trouble clef or bass clef. It's like a clef for rhythmic notation. Mm-hmm. And you can actually have uh, uh, a uh, a percussion, damn, uh, a drum, mm, it's a like a grid, mm-hmm. drum grid, where you say this is where snare drum is, this is where bass drum is, this is where cymbal. So if you have specific things that you want them to play, you can't write those out. Mm. However, it is important also to note that sometimes they don't have to play those things exactly that way. <laughs> so mm-hmm. sometimes you can just even write out, okay, well, this section, here's the chord changes. So you can at least know where the chords are mm-hmm. and you can listen to the form. And so while you're playing, you can listen to that. So 
So that, that's so that so you can't write out some things. Some things you can just have the changes. Uh, some some things you can just have a rhythm that a drummer can accent, and you can either write it out or you can just have the rhythm and say, okay, play this, uh, which whatever instrument works the best. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of drummers will appreciate that answer. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, kind of bringing this uh, all together, you know, what uh, music are you excited about now? You know, whether it's your own that you're going to that you're working on, uh, you're in the session right now. But I mean, your own music that you're preparing to maybe release or, or maybe even music you're listening to. What What's exciting to you that you see on the horizon? All right. Let me think about that. Man, it's so funny, man, because I'm always checking out different things. And then whenever I get asked, so what is it you listen to? I can't think of what it was. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's because it's such a in the moment kind of thing. It's right. like, oh, okay, yeah. And then when I'm asked, wait, uh, what was it? Uh, what happened? <laughs> Hello? Uh, that's weird. <laughs> uh, I will say that as far as my own music, uh, I am, there's, there's actually, it's an interesting time because I'm in New Orleans. I actually have a lot of bands that I've been putting together. Hmm. Uh, exploring a lot of different things, and uh, but one of them right now is uh, what what I'm uh, going to be under the banner of the BGQ Exploration, and that's BGQ is the Benny Goodman Quartet, and it's a group with vibes, and I'm playing vibes, piano, clarinet, and drums with no bass. Uh, but what what I'm going to be doing with the group, which we have been doing, and we'll be exploring more, is that I want to record and cover tunes that that group did not play hmm. and and i wanted so you know i mean we cover some of those standards and we do play those tunes but i want to play things that that band didn't play and right and i'm sort of putting it together right now but uh, you know the tunes would be some new tunes or maybe some tunes from the 70s or some tunes from the 60s or tunes that were pop tunes in the 70s mm -hmm. but <laughs> things that they didn't do but it's still going to be in that style or things from like, you know, composers that wrote later on <laughs> after that group existed uh, to say that there's, you know, you don't have to stick with just the 1930s. Like there's a lots of music that you can cover with that group. So that's one thing that I'm looking forward to doing. Um, but in terms of um, newer stuff, I'm trying to think of, Oh God. Um, I was well. It was a few years ago, but in terms of uh, popular music, there was a there was an album that I liked by a singer by the name of Laura Mavula, uh, phenomenal from it. That was a pretty good one, um, you know. And there's a uh, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, this is right, and I'll think of it as soon as I hang up. Oh, I'm uh, sure. Well, we can link everything in, in at the end. Of the, we'll put them in the note, show notes. No worries. We we anything you mentioned. Yeah, I will say that, I mean, even though he hasn't put out a record in a while, but that vibraphonist that I mentioned, Norbert Lucoran, like, he made three albums, and he's, it's, I, it's kind of hard to find, because I think he was, like, really local in France, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, 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 the music, I mean, you can Google him, but you're not going to mm -hmm. find as much as you would think, and one thing that was actually shocking to me was, I think he made a, a third record, and there was a, and you know, there were, they were, they, anyway, it was like a, I think a review, and they mentioned his first record, and then my name comes up. <laughs> and I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> Where they were like saying, yes, his first album was adored by musicians and critics alike, and in parentheses, Jason Marcellus does not dry up on praise. I'm like, what? <laughs> how did, it, it was true. It was actually true. But it's like, how did they? And this was in France. I'm like, and I was, I hadn't been living there yet. That hadn't happened. I'm like, how do you know this is true? I, you know, now I will, I did contact Norbert one time because sometimes he can be like hard to reach, but I just told him, like, man, this record is ridiculous. But, uh, you know, there have been things um, that, that there was that. Now, I'll tell you one record that was out in the past few years that I actually liked a lot was uh, by alto saxophonist Soweto Kinch. Hmm. It was an album called The New Emancipation. Yeah, where basically he deals with like hip-hop and jazz and rap and 
you know, he mixes all those things, but there's a story to the record, hmm. you know, which is the condition that we do, the conditions that we live in as people. It's sort of like saying that, you know, it's a new emancipation. It's a, it's a, it's a new slavery and so forth. And, you know, it was so funny because that's a joke. After a while, I said, wait, why are we listening to Robert Glass's Black Radio again? Why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, which, which that was actually a good record. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, but the joke was, this is actually killing too, but mm-hmm. you're not really hearing about it. Uh, but, um, I mean, but that was good too, but the new emancipation was amazing. Um, so those are some things that, 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 uh, that come to mind. Um, you know, I will say that I'm looking forward to hearing the newest record from vibraphonist Joel Ross. Hmm. I'm looking forward to that. I've had a chance to actually uh, hear Joel Ross live. And it's so funny. I found out about him online. You know, one of those, like, I don't know, on Facebook or something, and this video comes up. And here's Vi- This is a few years ago. Uh, there's a gig with vibraphonist Joel Ross. Like, who's Joel Ross? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of this guy. And, wow, he can play. Oh, wait a minute. No. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, so anyway, I'm looking forward to hearing that. So that's, uh, you know, so those are the things that, um, you know, those are the things that I come up with right now. But I may even send you some things later on. Oh, that'd be awesome. Well, Jason, we don't want to take too much up of your time, especially since you're in the studio session. But um, yeah, where well, can people check there, out your is music? Is there any other questions? Well, I mean, is there anything you'd like to, you know, with this platform, we have a large audience. Is there anything you'd like to share or any thoughts that you had you'd like to kind of get out there on either the music or any thoughts that you have? You know, you kind of articulated at the beginning some really, I think, in, interesting thoughts about the current, you know, situation and, and, and environment of jazz and, and the like. But if there's anything that, you know, you'd like to share, I, we'd love to, you know, share that. All right, there's one more thing that I will mention, only because, you know, it has something that's come up. But, uh, and, I'll, and I won't get, I'll just say this, is that I think it is important to, you know, to, to, to be able to learn uh, different ways to play the music. Mm. You know, now, now, of course, it is tough today because there's no real, to be honest, there's no real incentive to learn it. You may not get hired, but it does help if you know, you know, uh, things from the thirties and things from the forties and things from the fifties. And it helps whatever it helps with whatever it is that you want to do, even music now, you know? And so, uh, I think that that does help. Uh, as a side note, I also say is that it can help with alleviate anybody throwing around the word limited vocabulary. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there's some folks that will understand that. But, yeah. uh, I, I, I think they might. That. I think they might. Yeah, but I, that's what I will say to that. It, it, it is something that does help with whatever it is you want to do. You know, even even bringing in like you know more styles from now, it will help enhance even that. Mm-hmm. Awesome, great. Well, I mean, thanks so much for taking the time. We really appreciate this, and you know, we're gonna make sure to include all of your music and links to everything in the show notes. But uh, once again, thank you so much. I think our audience is going to really find this very helpful. And, and we found this so interesting. It was yeah. great hearing your thoughts on everything. Oh, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure doing the interview. Awesome, man. Have a great session, and uh, we will talk more soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Jason.